can stand me up at the gates of hell, but I won't back down. No, I'll stand my ground, won't be turned around, and I'll keep this world from dragging me down, but I'll stand my ground, and I won't back down. Hello everybody and welcome to another video. We lost Tom Petty, uh, one of the great American rock stars and I thought I would do a special video tribute looking at his classic 1989 album Full Moon Fever. This was the first Tom Petty album I ever heard. Heard it in the spring of 1990. I was 19 years old, I was at university. Going somewhere in a car with some friends one evening, my friend put it on the car stereo we heard Free Fall In and we were all grooving away in the car. It was just the most immaculate sounding record I think I'd ever heard up to that point. And I didn't know anything about Tom Petty. It was 1989, I'd never heard of him. I'd never heard any of his music. This was the first encounter with him. Um, I didn't know his connection to a lot of the music that I knew and loved. I was a Beatles fan, I was a ELO fan, a Jeff Lynne fan. Um, but I didn't know those connections. So this really was my introduction to Tom Petty and over the next two or three years this album and the subsequent one Into the Great Wide Open really soundtracked my life you know in a big way. This is one of the most played records in my collection not this actual record itself I had the album on CD uh, this is uh, a reissue bought in the last few months but Full Moon Fever just sums up now a whole period of my life you know a time of kind of youth and freedom mm. it just as an album it just cleared spaces in my mind it kind of opened up vistas you know all these references to places like you know Ventura Boulevard um, you know it, it, it was a classic American record it seemed to encapsulate the American dream it was exotic um, it was chilled it was beautiful sounding it was everything that a fantastic record should be in the sense that it, it kind of plugged you back into kind of early types of music you know rock and roll skiffle uh, a bit of blues and it had this wonderful Jeff Lynne production where everything just seemed to shimmer you know the music had been buffed to within inches of its life it was like a dream um, on vinyl or on, on CD and um, this album and the subsequent one, like I said, were hugely important to me at a time in my life when I was just trying to set out on that road, that rocky road, you know, into adulthood relationships and so on. I actually fell in love to this album. That didn't go so well. <laughs> but uh, it still brings back those kind of memories of, of freedom and um, youth. And so that's why I wanted to make this video. So I hope you enjoy it. We're going to be looking at the full story of how it came to be made, uh, with how Tom came to hook up with uh, Jeff Lynn and George Harrison, who features on this album. I'm going to be talking about the songs and how they were made, the stories behind the music, and uh, that's what we're going to do. So settle back, pour yourself a drink, and let us tell the story of Full Moon Fever by the late, great Tom Petty. Okay, here I am. Okay, so Full Moon Fever is actually the first solo album by Tom Petty. Um, he'd carved uh, an amazing career for himself already as the, as the lead singer and songwriter of uh, Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers. But this record was the first album credited just to Tom Petty and it kind of happened by accident really. He didn't go into it. 
he didn't uh, set out to make a solo album. He didn't set out to leave the Heartbreakers. Uh, it did cause some problems with the Heartbreakers later on, but it was not really by design. Well, I never planned to do one exactly. I just sort of stumbled into it, really. This record came out in the year 1989. In fact, it was released on April the 24th, 1989, uh, by MCA Records. It features uh, contributions from his backing band, uh, The Heartbreakers, notably uh, Mike Campbell, um, his longtime guitar player, absolutely fantastic guitar player. <laughs> The album was recorded, uh, largely recorded in Mike Campbell's house in a very small studio that he had in a kind of spare bedroom in his house. Some of the tracks, or at least one of the tracks, is, is engineered by Mike Campbell as well. The album also features guest contributions from uh, Jeff Lynne, uh, Roy Orbison, who unfortunately died uh, prior to its release, and George Harrison from The Beatles and uh, latterly The Travelling Wilburys, who Tom had become friends with. And the record really kind of shows Tom, in a way, going back to his roots, doing something very kind of rock and roll based, but at the same time, moving him forward into a kind of new area of sonic precision, really, courtesy of Jeff Lynne, who brings a very um, carefully considered aesthetic, I suppose, to the recordings. Um, it's a lot less raw and ready than a lot of the work that Tom had done already. The recording process was quite a low-key affair. It was mainly just, you know, friends, people making contributions in this very relaxed atmosphere uh, at uh, Mike Campbell's garage studio. Um, the recording of the album actually was interrupted um, because Tom and Jeff and George and Roy and Bob Dylan were uh, involved in the making of the Travelling Wilburys album, the first Wilburys album. Um, and in the end, the Wilburys album ended up coming out first. And uh, as a result of that, the critics started saying, you know, oh, um, he's he's carried on the Travelling Wilburys sound, you know, into his solo album. Whereas, ironically, it was this album, really, that that sound kind of started to emerge. Yeah, this this was done, almost all of it was done before the Travelling Wilburys. And then it was continued into the Wilburys recordings. This uh, album actually was Tom Petty's commercial peak. As an artist, it featured three hit singles. It rose to number three on the US Billboard 200 and number eight in the UK. Uh, there were five singles released from the album. Two of them hit the top 20 of the US Billboard 100 uh, and three topped the US mainstream rock chart. Uh, Full Moon Fever has been certified platinum uh, five times and it was a very high profile uh, album for Tom. So this is the Back to Black reissue, so before we get into the next stage of the video where I talk about how the album came to be, let me just quickly show you this. The songs are mainly written by either Tom Petty and Jeff Lynne working together, so for example Free Falling, I Won't Back Down, Zombie Zoo, A Mind with a Heart of Its Own, A Face in the Crowd. Some songs are also co-written by Mike Campbell, as in Running Down a Dream. Uh, there's one cover version, a bird song, Feel a Whole Lot Better, which was by Gene Clark. Uh, so a few, you know, a few different songwriters, produced by Jeff Lynne uh, with uh, Tom Petty and Mike Campbell, in fact. So it's not true to say that it's a pure Jeff Lynne production, but it's, it's definitely Jeff Lynne's sound, which is stamped all over this record. OK, so let's talk a little bit now about the background of the album and how it came to be recorded. OK, so the basic story behind this album and how it came to be is, is fairly sort of involved, really. Tom Petty, in I think around about 1987, uh, was involved with Bob Dylan. He was on tour with Dylan in the States uh, with the Heartbreakers. Um, and um, Tom's house burnt down. He, he he always said that it was arson, that it was a deliberate thing. I don't know whether it was ever solved or you know resolved, but he lost his house. He lost everything. Obviously, it was a you know devastating blow for him. He was on tour with Dylan, and he the tour ended up in going to England. And um, when the, the the tour got to Birmingham. Tom ran into uh, George Harrison, who was there with Jeff Lynne. 
Uh, now, Jeff and George had been friends for a few months by this stage. Um, that, I mean, that's another video. The story of how George Harrison and Jeff Lynn came to be involved with each other is a fantastic story, and I'll tell that on another occasion. Uh, but um, Tom ran into George and um, Jeff in Birmingham, and they spent some time together. Now, George had, at this point, had finished recording um, this album, Cloud Nine. I don't think it had been released at this stage. And what happened was George slipped Tom a cassette of the finished album to listen to, uh, and uh, Tom was completely blown away by it. He loved the way that Jeff and George had worked together to uh, reinvent George's sound, you know, to make it modern sounding, contemporary sounding, while still connecting back to all the kind of early rock and roll. Um, you know, that was the great skill that Jeff Lee and had at the time. So um, they met in Birmingham, socialised, got to know each other a bit, and then Tom flew home back to LA and was somewhat startled shortly after to run into Jeff Lynn at a traffic light, I think in Beverly Hills somewhere. They looked over and sort of, you know, saw each other, clocked each other. And uh, at the time, um, Jeff was working uh, with Brian Wilson on his uh, 1980s comeback album. They hooked up again and Tom asked Jeff what he was doing and, you know, Jeff asked Tom what he was doing. And they basically started to become friends, you know, properly hanging out together. And then at Christmas, this would have been probably 1987, Tom went to a restaurant and in the restaurant were George Harrison and Jeff Lynn. And just as he walked in, so the story goes, as Tom tells it, uh, Jeff was giving George Tom's address on a piece of paper. So it was a kind of strange synchronicity, you know, these kind of strands coming together. Uh, and at that point, Tom and George and Jeff actually all started hanging out together. And Tom and George Harrison in particular became really, really good friends, family friends. And um, a definite social scene was kind of, you know, starting to emerge between the three of them. Now, at this stage, Tom um, has a demo that he has made of the song um, You're So Bad, which is the first song that he wrote, really, for this album. I mean, it wasn't intended to be for an album, but he had it on a cassette. He gave it to Jeff Lynne. Jeff loved it. He said, what do you want to do with it? Tom said, why don't you come round to Mike Campbell's studio? Mike Campbell, the guitarist from the Heartbreakers. He's got a tiny little home studio, basically in his spare bedroom of his house. He said, come round and we'll record it. So Jeff uh, said, yep, yeah, okay, sure thing. So he went round to uh, the house and uh, they recorded You're So Bad, but more importantly, while they were there, uh, they started, or they wrote and recorded the song Free Falling. Uh, now, Free Falling was, my understanding is that it was written and recorded in about one day. And Tom Petty was completely and utterly blown away by this, the idea that you could make a record so quickly. That was what Jeff Lynne was a complete master at. He didn't mess about in the studio and he, he knew what he wanted he had a picture of it in his mind almost immediately, you know, after the song was written, he could just dream up an arrangement. He would hear it in his head, and but more importantly, he would know how to get it on tape really quickly. So they all kind of piled into this tiny studio. I think Tom said there was room for, comfortably, for about four people to stand up in this tiny room. They recorded um, Free Falling, and I'll talk more about that when we come to look at the album's songs in detail. Now the Heartbreakers are not around at this stage. Tom isn't intending to make a solo album. It just so happens that he's fallen into this recording and the Heartbreakers are nowhere around. So he thinks, right, well, okay, uh, I'm not gonna push it. I'm not gonna you know, actively go and search them out and you know, get them in. Let's just see where this takes us. You know, while I was fooling around with Jeff Lynn and the Heartbreakers were taking a long break, taking a year off, so. It's very hard for me to take time off, so I just <laughs> made an album. So, now at this stage, Tom starts thinking it would be cool to record some more music with Jeff, but Jeff has to return to England. I suspect it was because, I think it was because his parents had recently passed away, and Jeff was having to return to England in order to, to kind of tie up some loose ends, maybe sell the family home and so on, because, you know, at this stage, Jeff was living 
uh, in um, America, you know, in uh, LA. So he had to go home to sort things out. So Jeff said, well, we can still do it. Let's just try and record really, really fast. Let's try and make, let's try and write and record one song a day, you know, for like nine days, I think, I think he had. So Tom uh, was really invigorated by this idea and said, right, okay, let's go for it. Uh, and that is exactly what they did. They proceeded to spend the next nine days writing one song a day. Now, that didn't make up the full track list of the album in the end, um, but nine songs had been written. And um, a bit later on, Jeff went back to England. Tom ended up uh, recording another couple of songs. He recorded the song uh, All Right For Now, which is a nice... Um, kind of relaxing ballad really you know hardly any instruments on it you know very delicate Jeff Lynne wasn't involved in that and he also came up with the cover version of the bird song um, feel a whole lot better one of the reasons for doing this was that the record label MCA uh, thought the album was too short but actually there was a more serious problem and that is once the recording was finished and Tom turned the album in to MCA Amazingly, MCA didn't like it. Tom was absolutely devastated because he thought <clears throat> he turned in a really amazing record. And when he asked them, why, what's the problem? The A&R man at MCA said, uh, oh, we don't hear a single. <laughs> um, which when you consider what's on this record, you know, songs like Free Fall In, I Won't Back Down, uh, you know, Running Down a Dream, it just seems astonishing that this idiot couldn't hear a single on the next album that actually is a line in one of the songs in uh, in the song into the great wide open tom sings a line the a uh, the a and r man said i don't hear a single but anyway what happened is they rejected the album tom went away with his tail between his legs i think he did do a bit of extra recording at that point it might be that he then recorded the bird song i can't i'm not entirely sure but he, he got a bit more recording done and in the intervening time, the staff changed around at MCA. The guy who'd said to him, I don't hear a single, left. A new person joined. And all of a sudden, Tom went back to them, played them the record, and they uh, were absolutely bowled over by it. And they said, yeah, let's go for it. Let's, 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 uh, let's release it. So it kind of nearly didn't get released, but then it did. Now, originally, the album was going to be called Songs from the Garage. Garage because um, it had been done in such an impromptu way and they had a photograph taken of Tom just standing in Mike Campbell's garage, basically, you know, surrounded by instruments. Um, and then Denny Cordell, who was a producer uh, and a, a kind of old friend of Tom's, came round to the studio. Tom played him the, uh, the record and he said, you can't just call it Songs from the Garage, you, you know, you need a proper name. So Tom just dreamt up the name um, Full Moon Fever uh, and that's how the record uh, got its very distinctive title. Now one of the things that's interesting about the whole story of Full Moon Fever is the fact that uh, Tom teamed up uh, with Jeff Lynne who maybe on a superficial level you think this is not an ideal fit. Well, I mean, Tom Petty, it, it can't be underestimated really, the extent to which he was a fan of British pop music. Uh, he was a big fan of all the British invasion bands and he'd also been a fan of uh, Jeff's old band The Move and uh, Tom had been a big fan of the Move song Do Ya. <laughs> which was later recorded, re-recorded by ELO. ELO's version came about in 1976, which is really when Tom's recording career properly got underway. Um, Tom was a fan of ELO. He loved Jeff Lynne's work. When, when ELO came to an end, Jeff Lynne was very, very uh, disenchanted with the way recording techniques had gone in the 1980s. He'd made some kind of 
electronic y techno y records himself, but he didn't like all that. He didn't like being a computer programmer, is what he, he said at the time. And when he hooked up with, uh, with um, George Harrison, George was of the exact same mind in 1986. He said he was sick and tired of all these electro pop records. He didn't like drum machines. And that completely chimed with Tom Petty. That's exactly the sound that Tom wanted. He wanted to return to perhaps a more innocent time, a time when music sounded like people playing instruments. Jeff was a big fan of the very early rock and roll records. I mean, history has judged him as being a kind of Beatles copyist, but that's not true because the music of ELO and to a certain extent the stuff he did with The Move had deep roots in rock and roll. He was a big fan of Roy Orbison. He was a huge fan of uh, Del Shannon. And what he wanted to do or achieve in the studio from the mid to late 80s onwards was to try and recreate the spontaneity of those early rock and roll records, but do it in a very controlled studio environment. Still done quickly, you know, he didn't kind of slave over it. But the sound that he and um, Tom achieved on this record it is very, I would describe it almost as airbrushed. Was Full Moon Fever was recorded for the CD age, really. I mean, CDs had only just come in at this point. And even though it was a rock record, so-called, it was very, very uh, meticulous. It was, it, 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 it had the precision of a quartz watch, but everything was on display. You know, you couldn't sort of lose yourself in it. Everything was pristinely recorded, all the guitars, the way that Jeff would EQ everything, you know, the shimmer on the guitar was very, very precise and really it harked back to his work with ELO because ELO had always been an audiophile band in the sense of everything being very expensive and airbrushed and, and buffed to perfection. But the sound of that band was, you know, orchestral and choral, but Jeff then applied that to the rock and roll music, so-called, uh, of Full Moon Fever and that's why you get on this record a rather odd combination. On the one hand, it sort of sounds like spontaneous rock music, but on the other hand, it doesn't. It sounds like a very carefully contrived uh, studio concoction. It will appeal to some people, it won't appeal to other people, but that's kind of just, that's the way it was really. So, Jeff and Tom together in the studio uh, was a certainly you know, a very interesting combination and perhaps one that was more natural than some people at the time uh, you know, would have thought. Okay, so now it's time to take a look at the songs on the album, which we're going to do quite briefly. The first uh, song on the record is Tom's immortal anthem, Free Falling. Now, Free Falling was actually written on <clears throat> a small electric keyboard, which somebody had given Tom. Tom was messing around on it. He found the chord sequence and um, he was he made up the words to the verses on the spot. The verses make reference to various places uh, that Tom knew. It makes references to 101 Ventura Boulevard, uh, It mentioned, uh, which is a primary east-west thoroughfare in the San Fernando Valley. It mentions Mulholland, which is a reference to Mulholland Drive, a road that follows the ridge line of the eastern Santa Monica Mountains and the Hollywood Hills uh, between the San Fernando Valley and Hollywood. So there we go. But um, Tom was making up the words to the verses. He didn't have the chorus. Jeff Lynn started, I think Jeff shouted out the words, free falling, sing free falling. Tom started to sing it, but he was phrasing it differently to how it eventually turned out. He was trying to cram the words in, and it was Jeff who suggested that Tom, the first time round, sang I'm free, and the next time the chords went down, free falling. And once he, he sang it in that way, the two of them were both very excited because they realised they'd kind of struck gold, really. The song was written and recorded. Uh, very very quickly indeed and Free Falling is just one of the most expansive songs that uh, Tom ever wrote it just conjures up images of freedom of youth of uh, endless summers and free time the song has a an expansive shimmer to it uh, it's just beautiful to listen to it's airy it seems to float off the ground slightly it has a very floaty feel which is appropriate for the title 
just one of the great American songs uh, of all time. Now, I Won't Back Down was actually the first single from the album. It was written by Tom Petty and Jeff Lynne. It reached number 12 on the Billboard Hot 100. And it topped the album Rock Tracks chart for five weeks. And this song was written, apparently, in a glass booth just off to the side while Tom uh, was mixing Free Falling with Jeff. Tom recalled the recording of the song. He said that uh, at the session, George Harrison sang and played guitar. I had a terrible cold that day, and George went to the store and bought a ginger root, boiled it, <coughs> and had me stick my head in the pot to get the ginger steam to open up my sinuses, and then I ran in and did the vocal take. <laughs> so Tom did the vocal take for that song after, this, after doing this weird sort of herbal miracle cure from George. Um, now originally the lyric was in the chorus was hey baby I'm standing on the edge of the world and it was George who sort of nixed that and said uh, standing on the edge of the world what's that all about and Tom changed it to um, there ain't no easy way out and then Tom later said he was pleased that George had made that correction because Tom thought his original idea was in quotes dumb um, so I won't back down it's just one of those cool songs it kind of expresses spiritual, emotional, psychological strength. It was covered by Johnny Cash, famously, on one of the Rick Rubin albums that he made. Just a tight groove, smooth keyboard, some stinging lead work uh, from uh, Mike Campbell and uh, a rousing chorus. And Love is a Long Road was co-written with Mike Campbell. Jeff Lynne wasn't anything to do with the writing of this one. Apparently the original idea for the song was about motorbikes. Mike's original song, Tom said, was quite chaotic, uh, but Jeff Lynne straightened it out, uh, and Jim Keltner played the drums on this one. Surely written deliberately as a driving song, it's built around a propulsive keyboard riff. It features the heaviest drumming we've yet heard on the record, and uh, Tom's vocal has some of the old raucousness uh, that we know from uh, his previous music. You were just a face in the crowd out in the street. So, A Face in the Crowd is written by Tom and Jeff. It was released in March 1990 as the fourth single. Peaked at number 46 on the US Billboard chart. This one has Jeff Lynne and DLO written all over it. You know, it's creamy, it's melancholy, it's full of chiming, wistful guitars. It's one of those great kind of happy, sad songs that uh, that Jeff did so well. Running Down a Dream was a song co-written by Jeff, Mike Campbell uh, and uh, Tom Petty. It was released in July 89 as the second single from Full Moon Fever and um, it was really a nod to Tom's musical roots. Uh, there's a line in there, me and Del were singing Little Runaway, which of course references uh, Del Shannon and Runaway. Del was hanging around on the social scene at the time uh, you know, that uh, Tom and Jeff were involved with. Um, he was a kind of old associate of them and this song has a kind of large degree of, of classic rock and roll spirit in it you know it has this great big amazing uh, blazing air guitar solo from uh, Mike Campbell which just goes on and on and Tom said he had a great memory of, of Mike standing as still as a statue in the studio in this tiny studio where there was hardly room to turn around and, and Mike was just standing there like a statue just reeling off you know chorus after chorus of this incredible guitar solo and uh, it's, it's just one of the great guitar solos of the 1980s, really perfect for doing uh, some air guitar gymnastics. After what you did, I can stay on, and I'll feel a whole lot better originally uh, was by The Birds. The Birds version was released in 1965, it's very close to the original. Uh, it's a bit less raw. It doesn't have the big, loud, um, jubilant tambourine, 
but it's kind of lovingly rendered and recreated. It's um, it's a cover version which is a real strong tip of the hat to the birds, really, because, I mean, Tom's music did owe a huge amount to the birds, that kind of jangly American sound, you know, the sound of endless summer, slightly hazy. This is just a lovely song written by Gene Clark, um, the, uh, the original version. A, quite a canny cover version to choose for this record. It fits the mood of the record perfectly. And um, it's quite interesting now, if you go back and listen to the original version, or if I do anyway, I kind of almost hear Tom Petty singing it, you know, the vocal style. It was it was so close to the way the birds did it, that when you hear the birds doing it now, you think, oh, it's, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers. You're so bad Best thing I ever Now this song tells a little funny story. It tells it from the singer's viewpoint, but it's about his greedy sister who's lucky enough to marry a yuppie. Uh, then she gets divorced and she takes him for all he's worth. And she's now a swinger dating another singer while her ex-husband can't get anybody interested in him and is possibly bankrupt and is considering suicide. He had his head in the oven. Very, very good lyric. Very, very sharp, very funny, observational. And Jeff's contribution to this song was the E minor chord in the chorus where it goes to the But That's Not Me Baby. Tom was stuck at that point in the song. He didn't know how to proceed. And he said Jeff showed him this E minor chord. And it's a classic contribution for Jeff to make. Jeff was always a genius at finding the slightly unexpected left turn in a song that when you hear it, it just sounds absolutely perfect. And he was, he was also a genius at, uh, you know, mixing minor and major chords together. And that is a great moment in that song where it just tips into that little minor key. And uh, Tom said that, you know, for him, that actually made the song. Next, we have the song uh, Depending On You, which was written by Tom. This was a song which he already had. They were a little bit short of material for the album. Jeff asked Tom if he had any songs in his bottom drawer and Tom pulled this one out and they recorded it. For me, this is probably the only song on the album that does sound a little bit, you know, routine. I mean, it has a pleasing descending feel. There's a sort of neatly constructed bridge leading into the chorus. But I mean, for me, it's definitely the most forgettable song on the record. It's not bad. But it's just not quite up there for me uh, with the other tracks. Oh, yeah. Next we have The Apartment Song, written by Tom Petty on his own. Now this was originally written for the Southern Accents album. Uh, Jeff asked if he had anything uh, lying around. It features this fantastic little Buddy Holly segment, uh, which is just really great. You know, it kind of harks back to the earliest rock and roll music. Lovely percussive kind of drum clatter, you know, much like Buddy Holly used to have on records, such as Peggy Sue and so on. I absolutely love this. It's just a fine, skiffly rock and roll song, you know, with some lovely sandpapery snare drum on it. It's just one of those songs that will just get you dancing around the room, really, you know, very, very feel good. And the Buddy Holly section is just kind of really cheeky, really. It's just a sort of t tip of the hat to Buddy, and uh, it just works perfectly. And it really demonstrates this, this kind of unerring grasp that Tom had, and Jeff, of being able to not exactly pilfer from rock and roll history, but they were certainly able to borrow and weave influences into their music, which helped to you know, link it back into the tradition of, of great old time rock and roll music. Good night, baby, sleep tight, my love. May God watch over you from above. All Right For Now uh, was written by Tom Petty. This was after Jeff Lynn had gone back to England. It was written late at night and he said he had his kids in mind when he wrote it, featuring some lovely finger-picking guitar uh, from uh, Tom and Mike Campbell. It's a very, very nice kind of interlude on the record. It sort of reminds me a little bit of uh, Beth from uh, Destroyer by Kiss. You know, it's kind of almost right at the end of the record and uh, it just works really well for what it is. It's a slight kind of mood changer. Uh, and it allows Tom to give a much more intimate, quiet vocal performance than he's given so far. I 
Mind of Its Own, written by uh, Tom and Jeff. Now, the, the, the story behind this is quite funny. Jeff and Tom were out driving one day, heading to one of their houses. And when they got to where they were going, they got out of the car and they both said to each other, did you just hear the song that was on the radio just then? Because they were both listening to the radio in their respective vehicles. And the song that they had both been listening to was by Connie Francis, My Heart Has a Mind of Its Own. And they both agreed this was a great idea for a for a song if they were going to slightly change the slant of it. You know, they were, I mean, they were really scratching around for material now because they didn't have long to go before they had to uh, before Jeff had to go back to England so they just took this song title Jeff suggested that they sort of flip it around and then they uh, Tom introduced a Bo Diddley rhythm into it which again a bit like the Buddy Holly um, influence uh, on the apartment song just another great way of connecting the record back to those rock and roll roots uh, just a great up-tempo, uh, dancey rock and roll song. Um, kind of a nice way to um, build up to the final song on the album. And so we finish with Zombie Zoo, another co-write uh, between Tom and Jeff. Tom apparently heard the name Zombie Zoo spoken by a mohawked punk in a dine and it was on the night when Tom and Jeff were driving over to see Roy Orbison uh, to ask him if he wanted to be in the Travelling Wilburys. They were with George Harrison as well. They called off on the way or maybe on the way back at a diner and Tom ran into a, a couple of punks. Uh, he asked them what they were doing and one of them came up with this phrase Zombie Zoo. Tom grabbed that as a title and uh, it just kind of ran with it really it's just a fun track at the end you know nothing madly serious uh, it just has a kind of nice groove to it as does the whole album and it just gets things uh, wrapped up in a kind of spirit of bonhomie and uh, you know it's a, just a very uplifting album closer <laughs> Okay folks, so we're coming to the end of the video. Full Moon Fever, what a great album this is. I think I think time will tell, you know, where this album is going to fit into the kind of pantheon of great albums. For me, it's certainly one of the best sounding, most well-written records of the last 30 years, no question about it. One of the main things I love about this record actually just is the songwriting. Just the simplicity of the songs, you know. I mean, there are some people who are great at using fancy chords and, you know, sequences. Think of bands like Steely Dan and so on, you know, who are just masters at stringing together very, very complex chord sequences and, and ideas, you know, borrowed from jazz. But what's great about this record and Cloud Nine comes to that and, you know, other Tom Petty albums is just, it's just a handful of chords. You know, most, most of the songs on the record, you can play them on the guitar, you know, if you know G, C, D, just a few simple major chords, just a couple of minor chords, throw them in and... But how how do you get a really good, catchy, memorable song out of that, which isn't, you know, too simplistic or, or naff? And just given the speed with which they wrote the songs, you know, I mean, if I had nine days to come up with, you know, a bunch of songs, I, I'm as certain as can be that I would not have been able to come up with a track list like this. You know, I won't back down and love is a long road and mine with a heart of its own. And yet, when you break them down and try and play them on the guitar, you know, a beginner could play them. And uh, that, to me, is the sign of, of truly great songwriting, when you can make something really memorable and which stands the test of time, using very limited resources. And uh, I think, as well, I think the record is, is, is very special because it really demonstrates the power of what you can do with a couple of guitars, some lyrics, an amp, a drum kit um yeah it's not the most kind of raucous or authentic sounding record ever it has that studio sheen to it but i don't think that really takes anything away from it just one of the great albums uh, of all time in my opinion if you're interested in in knowing more about tom petty i can recommend this book which i used for a lot of my research for this video Tom Petty uh, in conversation with Paul Zollo. This contains many, many interviews with Tom going back over the years where he explains the genesis of a lot of his songs. 
uh, the way he goes about songwriting. He says he finds songwriting a very difficult thing to do. Songs don't come easy to him. He said when the rest of the band used to go off in between tours and just have fun and you know live the rock and roll lifestyle, he would spend his time locked in a lonely apartment uh, trying to write songs. And he described it as a very painful and solitary process. And I think, again, what's kind of special about this record is that this represented a really happy time in Tom's life where he was able to hook up with Jeff Lynne and by all accounts, they just had a ball, you know, as with the whole of the Wilburys project. This record, the Wilburys albums, Into the Great Wide Open, the sequel to this, they were all born out of this friendly scene, you know, friends getting together, just enjoying each other's company and uh, just making the best use of their very considerable talents, uh, all working together. Fantastic. What a great era, what a great time for music and what a great record. Tom Petty, Full Moon Fever. Thanks for watching.